Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 27 of the Madden America podcast. A little later, we hear from Madden America founder Robert Whittaker. But first, I'm delighted to say that we have an interview with Professor Sir Robin Murray. Professor Murray is an honorary consultant psychiatrist in the Psychosis Service located at the Bethlehem Royal Hospital in South London. He is also a professor of psychiatric research at the Institute of Psychiatry. His research covers epidemiology, molecular genetics, neuropsychiatry, neuroimaging, neuropsychology and neuropharmacology. He is the second most widely cited psychiatrist in the world. Professor Murray's main research interest is finding the causes of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, as well as developing better treatments for these disorders. He is perhaps best known for helping to establish the neurodevelopmental hypothesis of schizophrenia, and for his work on the environmental risk factors relating to schizophrenia, such as obstetric events and cannabis use. Professor Murray was awarded a knighthood for services to medicine in 2011. Professor Murray, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me for the Madden America podcast. To begin, I wanted to ask about your long and distinguished career. You're known as one of the world's most influential researchers in psychiatry. So what was it that led you towards psychiatry? Well, I decided to do medicine to do psychiatry. So I had decided to do psychiatry by the time I was 16. And was there anything particularly about psychiatry that led you towards it as opposed to perhaps more functional medicine? I went to a boarding school, which I disliked very much, a a, a unisex boarding school, and I wasn't particularly happy in it. I began reading psychology and then I started reading Freud. And the combination of uh, sort of philosophical insights and psychological insights from Freud and a lot of sex, of discussion of sex, was irresistible to a 16-year-old boy at a, at a unisex uh, boarding school. And you're a world-renowned authority on psychosis and extreme states. So what was it that sparked your interest to start research in the area of schizophrenia and psychosis? Well, I think, uh, so going through medicine, I, I liked the psychiatry and when I was in the fourth year of medicine, there was the opportunity to go and live and work in a mental hospital, mm. I guess in these days called an asylum. And uh, in Scotland, people who were in an asylum, and many people, of course, were there for, for long periods of years, it was, a, it was the law that they had to have, have a physical examination once a year. Mm. So medical medical students like me we did, did a sort of deal with the hospital authorities that we would do so many so many physical examinations on patients, and in return for that, we got our board and lodging in the in the psychiatric hospital. Mm. So it was a uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience. I uh, you know to, for for a medical student, it wasn't so great for patients, but uh, it meant that I could. Uh, I get to get to know a uh, patients and actually one of the curious things about asylums then was that there were because many for many patients it was their home that there were patients who functioned as uh, as, uh, as members of staff and uh, uh, unofficially and uh, took on quite a lot of responsibilities and and one got to know these people quite well and uh, I in many ways, they were extremely, although they had a diagnosis of, of psychosis, they were extremely sensible. And it, it was only when you probed in or by accident, you got into a sort of an area that uh, that uh, they were particularly concerned about. Then you began to realize that they had strange ideas. So I had a surprising amount of, of experience of, uh, of being with uh, people with psychosis as a medical student. Thank you. And Robin, I wanted to ask a little bit now about the concept of schizophrenia, because I understand that schizophrenia as a concept is still quite fluid. And I wondered if you could help me understand the journey that we've been on to get from perhaps what was initially a neurodevelopmental model to a more recent view that takes account of social or environmental factors. Well, actually, I go back uh, longer than that. So I came into psychiatry when there was a sort of pitched battle going on between 
uh, anti-psychiatrist such as Ronnie Lang and the orthodox uh, psychiatric view that that schizophrenia was uh, a, 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 a disease. Mm. And uh, so it uh, was a very interesting uh, time. I was particularly interested in, in Lang because Lang came from Glasgow, which is where I graduated. So I was interested in in, in his work and uh, it, and of course devoured his classic book, the, the the Divided Self. But then when I came into to uh, psychiatry, I realised that though it was a very attractive theory, there was there was no evidence base for it. I and so I became more interested in the orthodox view. And at that time, schizophrenia was thought to be an adult onset disease. Mm. It was thought to be a discrete uh, disease, which affected uh, people in their early adult life and then showed a sort of progressive deterioration. So I guess that uh, and that, that uh, was bolstered by the first uh, imaging studies that came out in the late 70s. And uh, I was never... Uh, very enthusiastic about the idea of, a, of it being a deteriorating illness, mm. and uh, and I, I started doing research in in the developmental aspect. So so I was one of the or in in the U.S. a psychiatrist called Danny Weinberger, and in the U.K. myself and a chap called Sean Lewis. We put forward the idea that schizophrenia was in part a uh, a, a neurodevelopmental condition, and uh, so I think uh, the, 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 there was a, a big switch in the in the in the eighties from thinking of it being as a degenerative disorder to think of, thinking of it uh, 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 as a disorder where there was subtle uh, a deviation uh, from from no normal development. So that was really the, the the sort of first area that I did a lot of research in. But it was still a from a very biological point of view, mm. and actually, people of my generation had seen what had happened to families when those devotees of Ronnie Lang and others had uh, accused parents of not only having a child who was uh, who, who who was unwell and got a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but which was bad enough. But then saying to them it was their fault because it was the way they brought them up. And there was a lot of theorizing about that in the 60s and 70s. And that did families no end of damage. Mm. So people like me were a bit allergic to going back to uh, to thinking about uh, social factors. And in particular, uh, the idea that, uh, that, that parents could induce a, a, a schizophrenia. So that was really the, the origins of my research were were really into... A developmental models of, a, of, of well, certainly of schizophrenia in these days. Mm -hmm. So then, then uh, where I work in South London, we have a lot of migrants, and in particular, we have a lot of migrants from the Caribbean and from uh, from from Africa. Well, actually, they're not, they're not necessarily migrants now, but they were migrants in the 50s and 60s. Uh, so so there's a, a, now a big population of people who were originally uh, of African Caribbean or African origin. And it became clear that the frequency of uh, getting a diagnosis of schizophrenia or other psychosis was much elevated in this population. Mm -hmm. Something like the, 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 the rates range between four and four and nine times that in the general population. Mm -hmm. And so we got, we were just confronted by this huge issue in uh, in our clinical work, and it became clear that the fact that there, were, there weren't biological reasons for this, that uh, the rates weren't increased in, in the Caribbean. We did studies, my colleagues did studies over there, but it was something to do with with migrating migrating to to Britain mm -hmm. or the reaction of people in Britain, and so it became clear that this was a really a social phenomena. It was a consequence of social factors. So that was really what started me being interested in social factors, I guess, about 1990. It's quite a journey, isn't it, to see that progression in time and how we conceive of and understand schizophrenia. Was that work challenging to be involved in? Did you find it exciting to be part of that shift in attitudes? 
Well, when when I say that's a shift in attitude, that's a shift in my attitude. Mm. That's not necessarily shared by. Uh, there would be a lot of particularly North American psychiatrists who would not say uh, pay so much attention to uh, social factors. So it's uh, the, the 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 rise of interest in. Well, excuse me. That's, this is this is wrong to say this. Psychiatrists. North American, British, European have always been interested in social factors as a cause of relapse, mm. as a cause of people getting people who had recovered. It was always the case that psychiatrists realised that uh, some some uh, adverse event could precipitate the recurrence of the illness. Mm. But what was not realised was that it could actually contribute to the origins of of the, of the illness. So. It was really when we started looking at uh, the the rates in, in in people of Caribbean origin and realised that there didn't seem to be a biological explanation of this. For example, we looked at the we took our patients a uh, black and white, and when we looked at the the risk to brothers or sisters, siblings in the white population, it was about five percent. Mm. When we looked in the relatives of our black patients, it was about 5% in people, in the brothers and sisters who were living in the Caribbean, but it was about 20% in the brothers and sisters who were living in the UK. So it was an interaction between, it, it, it was something to do with the environment. And so we, we, we then got interested in that and and other environmental factors. Thank you. And Robin, I wanted to ask what that means, if anything, for the way that we currently diagnose schizophrenia. Because I've watched some wonderful talks of yours where you point out that it's actually quite normal to have delusional beliefs. Most of us hold some very strange beliefs, but yet we don't receive a diagnosis of being psychotic or schizophrenic. So it must be very difficult to draw a fixed line and say, past this point you have this diagnosis and before it you don't. So I just wondered if in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, whether the criteria we use to diagnose schizophrenia are in any way sensitive to factors outside normal biology. Well, when you say the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, you mean, what do you mean by that? I mean the DSM. Yes, the DSM. I assume that's where the criteria are laid out in terms of how one would diagnose someone as suffering with schizophrenia. Well, it is a parochial a system of diagnosis appropriate perhaps for bits of North America. Mm. But it's got nothing to do with the UK or, or Europe or the rest of the world. Oh, okay. That's not something I appreciated. I assumed that the DSM was, I suppose, the Bible of psychiatric diagnosis. No, I would be very irate if I found uh, my junior colleagues uh, using the DSM to make diagnoses. I've always regarded the UK as a DSM-free zone. There is the the, the international the, the international equivalent, which is by the WHO. Is that the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases? Yeah. Okay, I understand. Thank you. So, in that case, then I suppose the more appropriate question is: Is the ICD perhaps a more open-minded document than the DSM? Well, it has far fewer diagnoses, right. uh, and uh, and it has less of the sort of cookbook. A recipe that you know, if you take X, Y, and Z, then you and you don't have A, B, and C, then you get a particular diagnosis. But this is not to say that diagnosis is not uh, a problem. The the essential difference between diagnosis in psychiatry and diagnosis in medicine is that if you go to see a physician and you have chest pain, then the physician will take a history and will then say to you. This could be a number of things. This could be pneumonia. It could be uh, tuberculosis, or it could even be the beginnings of of, a, of heart disease. Mm. We'll do some tests, and uh, then we'll we'll distinguish them. And that's what you can't do in psychiatry to to this point. So psychiatric diagnosis is almost exclusively based on symptoms. And of course, there is no external. So, in in a sense, a, a psychiatric diagnosis is what we say it is. We cannot test whether it is or until this point. We've not been able to test whether, whether it's true or not. And uh, so that 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 
that is the distinction. If a uh, if there is a question, if you have a a a, 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 a tumor on your lung or pneumonia, they can be clearly distinguished by by, by tests. Mm. But psychiatry continues to 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 be based on signs and symptoms in the way that medicine was, say, in the nineteen in the nineteenth century. So so the the the, the, the difficulty is say. Uh, is that we, we don't have any validity any validity we, we can now that we psychiatrists can be trained to, to make diagnoses reliably and uh, you can teach people to use a particular criteria and a uh, psychiatrists in Russia or psychiatrists in uh, Australia or psychiatrists in uh, Italy or psychiatrists in Britain would all be reliable in that but the question is whether 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 Schizophrenia is an, a, a real entity, or whether it's a, 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 a man-made ar artifact. So that 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 is the problem which we, with which we're confronted. That must be a very difficult judgment to make. And also, Robin, it makes me wonder whether the reason that not all but many treatments in psychiatry are symptomatic, and particularly here I'm thinking about psychiatric drugs, because they generally treat the symptoms but don't have a role in addressing underlying causes. And so I wonder whether that symptomatic treatment pathway is related to the fact that, as you say, diagnosis is quite a symptomatic-led thing. I, I think that's partially true, but I wouldn't immediately uh, link them. The, I, I, I think the, the, the medications address biological mechanisms. Mm. They don't just uh, treat... Well, for example, if I, if I think of somebody who has psych psychosis, then... A tranquilizer like uh, benzodiazepines, Librium or Valium, might be something you would treat the, the, the symptoms, and uh, and uh, people would be sedated. But it doesn't have any. It doesn't have anything to do with what we understand about the mechanism of uh, of psychosis. Where, whereas what we call antipsychotics do at least a uh, block a dopamine, which we know is involved as the final ca common pathway of of psychotic symptoms mm -hmm. so you're, you're correct that it's not addressing the cause but if they uh, if in some cases the cause is social then you wouldn't necessarily expect a drug to address the cause because the cause uh, it, 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 it lies in the social realm realm and uh, we, we we may be uh, blocking the, the, the some of the consequences i'll give you an example and I, 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 you might think uh, of asthma Asthma is a disorder of the, of the lungs, but the cause may not be in the lungs. The cause may be the fact that uh, you, you unfortunately lay, uh, live 100 meters from a motorway mm -hmm. uh, and are get, you, your lungs are getting full of, uh, full of pollution. Now, you can think that a, a, a medication may be able to uh, uh, prevent the full expression of the asthma, but it's not going to do anything about the cause. Absolutely. That's a really good example. Thank you. And Robin, I'd like to ask a little more about antipsychotic drugs, if that's okay. Could I just say a little bit more about the question of, 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 of social factors? Mm. And I, I, I think one of the great things about where I work is the Institute of Psychiatry is that we've always had very brilliant young uh, uh, colleagues coming to, 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 to work there. And I've learned I guess more from them than they've learned from me. And in the 90s, we had a whole group of uh, very able uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and others who were interested in social factors. And Jim Van Os would have been one of them. I guess you've interviewed him previously. Yeah. Uh, Craig Morgan, David Castle, people who've now spread out across the world. But I think a whole group of them they, they, they were, were, were interested in social factors. And uh, it was they who, in many ways, convinced me that uh, social factors were, were, were important. Thank you for that clarification, Robin. I wanted to ask for your thoughts on antipsychotic medications, because they are seen as a highly effective treatment for those suffering psychotic symptoms, but they are also starting to be used as adjunct therapy for depression too. And 
I myself have been prescribed an antidepressant and several times have been asked to consider an antipsychotic on top, but that was for treatment-resistant depression rather than psychosis. So I just wanted to ask broadly what your view was on the use of antipsychotic drugs. Well, I think most of the antipsychotics we have block dopamine and uh, essentially the disorder in which we th- we think that are not we think that we know that there is a, an excess of production of dopamine when somebody is acutely psychotic it, 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 it's it, it's psychosis so there is a rationale for using a, a, a medications that uh, block do, block dopamine in psychosis I, I don't know that there is so much of a rationale in other con- conditions. Some antipsychotics have other actions, like they're, they're sedatives. So sometimes a drug like quetiapine might be prescribed uh, for its sedative effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, some antipsychotics are thought to have weak uh, antidepressant effects. A drug like lorazidone uh, would, would have some some effects. But personally, I, I am... Uh, not enthusiastic about the use of antipsychotics in conditions other than a uh, psychosis, certainly in, lo- the, in the long term. For example, in a bipolar disorder, over the last 15 years, there's been an increasing use of antipsychotics as well as or sometimes replacing mood stabilizers. Mm-hmm. If I had a uh, bipolar disorder, I would want a mood stabilizer rather, rather than an antipsychotic. Mm-hmm. So I think in in most circumstances. I, I myself think that uh, antipsychotics uh, are, use, are, are useful in, and obviously one's got to be cautious about their prescribing in, in, in psychotic conditions. Thank you, Robin. And there was something specific that I wanted to ask about. I read in your very helpful paper that you shared with me about dopamine supersensitivity. And I wondered if you could help me understand how dopamine supersensitivity might occur and what we understand about that process. So we're talking about the connection between one nerve cell and another cell, which is co- and in between the two nerve cells, there's a little gap called the synapse. Mm. And the first nerve cell will release dopamine, which goes across the synapse and then hits the receptor on the, se- on the second day. A, a neuron, and we know that, for example, we know that people who've uh, been subject to child abuse will be more likely to uh, to to respond to stress by having a bigger increase in dopamine than others. And we know that, for example, a drug a drug drug use which is associated with psychosis, such as amphetamines, methamphetamine, cannabis, that they also impact on dopamine. So we're really trying to, uh, with antipsychotics, uh, we, 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 we are not clever enough to have medications that ameliorate the production or, or modify the production of dopamine. Yes. What we do is try and block its effects. And it's uh, certainly true in animal studies that if you block the dopamine receptor uh, for a period of weeks, then the, res- then the nerve responds by the, re- the nerve is all, is sort of one. Uh, the nerve cell is sort of wondering why is there no dopamine getting through to me. So it, it responds by increasing the number of receptors mm. in an attempt to try and scoop up what, what dopamine there is. And uh, as a result of that, there's you, you the, in animal studies you actually then need to give more antipsychotic uh, in order to block these receptors. And uh, in in some some in some circumstances. You may have to to, to do this again. So there is the question as to whether this happens in people as well, mm-hmm. and it's it's not it's very difficult to study this, uh, and it's not for want of trying that uh, we've tried that uh, that a range of researchers have tried to to, stu- to study this, but it is perhaps one explanation amongst others for why people who have previously responded to antipsychotics begin to respond less or on a, if they have a, a subsequent, say they've recovered and then they have a subsequent relapse, that they seem to need more medication or even that they stop stop responding to, to antipsychotics. And the conventional view is that about 20% of people uh, who have psychotic experiences 
will it will 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 stop responding to antipsychotics and maybe this super sensitivity is one explanation for that so it's an area that i'm very interested in and unfortunately there's a lot more opinion about it than there is fact mm -hmm. uh, what we do know is that the, there there are more recent drugs which don't call, cause this i don't know if you've come across what are called dopamine partial agonists so the traditional drugs are dopamine blockers, yep. things yep. like risperidone, olanzapine, chlorpromazine, haloperidol. But there are uh, several drugs uh, <coughs> such as uh, aripiprazole or uh, uh, cariprazine, which are not blockers, but uh, have a sort of weak effect similar to dopamine. So they actually stimulate the the second nerve cell, but much more mildly than the, the, the intrinsic dopamine. So in some ways, they are, they, are more, they, they are more physiological. They're not blocking the receptor. They're I, I sort of toning it down. And they don't cause this supersensitivity. So one of the questions which I think research has got to answer is whether there would be advantages in the long term in using these, these uh, uh, partial agonists rather than a blocker. It may be that the partial agonists are more physiological and more more like the brain normally works than that than the blockers. And it could be we we don't know yet. It could be that there would be advantages in the long term in their use. Absolutely. And Robin, this might be a difficult question because, as you say, this is such a difficult area to study. But in people that have perhaps taken antipsychotic drugs for a significant period of time and may have experienced this dopamine supersensitivity. I wonder what the research tells us about what happens if that person were to reduce or stop their medication. Does their brain revert to a pre-antipsychotic drug state, or do we just not know that at the moment? We uh, we, we we do know that, and uh, we know that both from animal studies and human human studies that uh, I, it's it's most clearly shown in animals that the the. The, the 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 brain receptors will just go will just norm, normalize in animals over a, a period of weeks. Pro my bet would be in humans so over a period of months. Uh, so it's not a permanent it's not a, a a permanent effect. It's not so unusual in with medicines that a medicine will cause a change, and then a if you stop the medicine, it takes some time for it to revert. It's, it's always a bad thing to stop medicine suddenly, mm. and that's one of the the, 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 the problems in in, uh, in in treating people with psychosis. Because qu quite often people with psychosis will make a good recovery, and they it, say they had been in they had to be in hospital uh, for a, for a little, a little period, and then they then once they come to see, to see the psychiatrist in the, out, in the outpatient clinic, they feel absolutely fine, they would like to stop the medication, uh, and there has been this sort of view among some psychiatrists that they have to stay on the medication for a very long time, or even for life. Mm. And if a patient says to the psych psychiatrist, I would really like to, to, to think to get off the medication, and the psychiatrist says, no, you have to stay on it uh, for at least five years or for life, and that's probably that's the last time the the, the, the the patient's ever going to come and see the psychiatrist, and he's probably going to he's going to throw the the medication in the in the rubbish in the rubbish in, in a couple of days, which is the absolute worst thing that have to happen to stop a medication like an a, an antipsychotic or an anti a, antidepressant. You have to to decrease it very slowly, because you all in, in all these kind of medicines you get a, re, a rebound, so. Uh, the worst thing is to is to fall out with one psychiatrist and th and throw the antipsychotics in the bin, uh, in disgust with the with, with the, the the view you have to take them for a long time. The sensible thing is for the psychiatrist and the patient. Well, the psychiatrist to say to the patient, well, personally, I think maybe you should stay on them a bit longer. But why, why don't we see how you are next time we meet? And if you're getting on fine, then we'll just decrease the the, the medication just a little bit, and we'll see how how you're doing fine. If you're doing uh, fine then, then we'll meet again and uh, maybe by another three months we might be able to decrease them decrease them yet again. And so that uh, one would slowly decrease the medication, uh, but always in the knowledge that the, the patient uh, 
has has to know that they should they have to be on the, on the lookout just in case there's any recurrence of the symptoms. If there are, if there is a recurrence of the symptoms, one can stop at that point and maybe put the medication up a little bit temporarily. Well, I'm really heartened to hear, Robin, that psychiatrists are involving their patients in those discussions. Well, I would think that would be the norm. I would hope that would be the norm in the UK. I think there's perhaps more of a worry about this where general practice or family doctors are concerned. Yes, this is uh, general practitioners are scared of psychosis. They don't understand it. And I'll give you an example that about 18 months, maybe two years ago, the mother of a patient of mine emailed me and said that you'll remember my son that you you looked after him in 1995 and uh, you prescribed about 20 milligrams of olanzapine and uh, I, I went back and looked at the notes and I, I had written a note, I, I'd written a letter to the local psychiatrist saying that uh, this chap had recovered well on 20 milligrams and hopefully it would be possible to decrease the medication and uh, and and see how he got on with on a, on a lower dose mm. uh, because 20 milligrams of olanzapine is very sedating but she the, the, the mum phoned me 20 years later you know 25 years later actually she she, me, she emailed me to say he was still on this 20 milligrams because the, the psychiatrist that said he was doing fine had discharged him to the gp and the gp had just resisted all all attempts to decrease the medication uh, for for over 20 years. So I'm sure there are people like this that get stuck on medication. This chap was uh, had put on lots of weight, uh, wasn't getting up till lunchtime, couldn't concentrate on things. Uh, I mean, this was entirely unnecessary that, that he had been on these high doses of antipsychotics for all these years. Mm. Yet I, I think it is the case that I don't think it's appropriate myself that uh, that GPs should, should be... Uh, solely in charge of, uh, of the care of people with, with, with psychosis. I think clearly GPs are in a very difficult position with so much call on their time and so much pressure on the health services. But if you look at the nice guidelines that doctors use, certainly for antidepressants, I can't honestly say that I've seen the guidelines for antipsychotic drugs. It's still talking about take your patient off their medication within a short period of time by halving the dosage over two weeks. And as you so eloquently explained, when the brain is making these adaptations to the presence of the drug over a long period of time, then it's the return to normality that needs to be taken account of in withdrawal experiences, isn't it? Yes, and of course, here you have to remember that drug companies spend a lot of time and effort to develop new drugs and to develop the the uh, to, to 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 develop the proper regimes for their prescription. But uh, drug companies naturally are not so interested in 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 in, in, in studying the uh, what is the best way to come off a medication. Mm. It's just I mean these are companies that that, that uh, they, they 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 have to make a profit for their shareholders. So they are not going to spend uh, a couple of billion dollars as they would on developing a drug. Uh, they're not going to spend a couple of billion dollars on on better ways of withdrawing from the drug unfortunately. Absolutely. But I'm pleased that psychiatrists such as yourself, Robin, and Jim Van Oss and others are talking about the need to help people withdraw from their medications and managing that process between the patient and the doctor. That's so important, isn't it? Yes, I think it's true. But you have to remember that people like Jim Van Oss and I have a very privileged life. Mm. We are academic professors who spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the illness and not so much time treating patients with it. That we may see, we may do, you know, we may sp- spend one or two days looking after patients. We are, we are, we are, we are not seeing patients from nine o'clock on a Monday morning till five o'clock, or later on a, a Friday evening with a queue, a, a, you know, a queue, a queue of other patients out the door. So I think uh, one, one, one can understand. The, the, psychi- the psychiatric services, certainly in the UK and uh, uh, and the psychiatric services, sadly in the in the USA, are much worse. Uh, that that say uh, that uh, psychiatrists are, are very hard pushed, and uh, often they don't have a, a time to talk with their patients, and very frequently there aren't psych- psychologists and social workers that they can call on to help. Mm. So. In some ways, 
unfortunately, psychiatrists get pushed. Psychiatrists, psychiatrists get pushed into defending bad psychiatry. It's not that we want to to, to practice bad psychiatry. It's that's what that's what the the resources that we're given enable us to do to do in many areas so and in many countries well certainly there are multiple factors to consider aren't there robin and the amount of people bought within the psychiatric system because of the dsm and its expanding number of diagnoses the ever expanding number of diagnoses is again an american phenomenon yeah that by and large the 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 the, uh, the, the number of diagnoses in in, in the icd icd the classification has not expanded in the way. And I think you have to also remember that in North America, psychiatrists are in a system which uh, uh, rewards more, you getting more patients. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, there is, an, there is an incentive to enlarge the, the population who maybe it falls under psychiatry. Mm. In countries which, where the services are hard pressed, it's actually the opposite. So most psychiatrists in the in the British National Health Service, the last thing they want is more patients because they don't have enough time to deal with the patients that they already have. So uh, I think uh, uh, they, they, it, it, w- w- one has to see the, diff- the, the different pressures on the, uh, on, uh, on uh, psychiatrists in, in different systems. Thank you. That's important to recognise. And Robin, as we come towards the close, in talking about the pressures on psychiatry now and the way we respond to people struggling with their mental health, I wondered if I could have your thoughts on what the future might hold, maybe specifically for schizophrenia and psychotic illness, but perhaps also more broadly too. Well, I can only really talk about psychosis. I, I, I don't really know much about other uh, other aspects of, of psychiatry. I, I think in relation to psychosis, and uh, we haven't really just talked about it, but schizophrenia is just a term that's traditionally been used for for severe psychosis. So I see these conditions really as a gradation, a bit like blood pressure, that uh, over a certain level of blood pressure, that it's helpful to have some intervention, either to be doing more exercise or taking some medication and so on. And I see the, uh, or, or avoiding stress, and I, I, I see a psychosis and schizophrenia in the same in the same way, but I think the way in which medicine has progressed is by understanding uh, that different causes can end up with the same symptoms. Mm-hmm. That say, uh, for ex- if you take something like heart failure, you can have heart failure. You're breathless. You get ankle swelling. You have no energy. You 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 may have a, a chest pain. Now you can develop that because you've had rheumatic fever as a child or you can develop it because you've had a heart attack or you can develop it uh, because you've had you've contracted some 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 infection so there are a whole range of causes that could cause the same symptoms but physician medicine has has developed to the level at which they can distinguish these and they can treat the causes in psychiatry we've not done that yet psychosis is still a sort of umbrella term for a whole range of different conditions that just happen to have the same symptoms. Mm. But un- the underlying etiology, the underlying uh, cause will be quite different. So we know, for example, that uh, there are a very small number, maybe something like 3% of people who get a diagnosis of uh, schiz- schizophrenia would actually have a, a, a mutation in certain genes which are involved in brain development. Mm. And uh, then there are also some suggestions that uh, there may be some types of a uh, psychosis which are a response to a, an immune response of, of the brain and these sort of organic conditions may you know comprise five six percent of people who currently get a diagnosis of, of, of schizophrenia then there are people whose psychosis has mainly been driven by the, 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 the by child adversity physical or sexual abuse in, 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 in childhood who mostly have positive symptoms then there are other, and we haven't talked about this at all, the biggest issue in relation to psychosis at present is cannabis use. Mm. And in South London, a 25% of all the people that we see with psychosis would not have developed if they hadn't been a heavy users, like daily users, maybe four or five times a day users of a high-potency cannabis. 
it stands to reason the treatment for somebody who has uh, developed psychosis because of uh, child abuse is going to be radically different from somebody who's developed like, the same kind of symptoms, but because they've been throwing a lot of chemicals at, the, at their brains. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, we're going to, we'll be moving towards distinguishing between these different conditions and distinguishing between the diff different treatments. For example, psychological treatments are going to be much more appropriate for somebody whose uh, psychosis arise, arises out of child abuse or, or life adversity then so, so, so that it may not be appropriate for a while to have psychological treatment for somebody whose uh, whose receptors have been messed up by the use of ketamine or methamphetamine or uh, or, or, or cannabis. Mm. It may be that different uh, psychological treatments. It may be that different uh, uh, pharmacological treatments may be appropriate for uh, uh, for for people with these different uh, conditions. So I would. Look forward to a time when we don't talk about uh, schizophrenia uh, at all, but it, it sort of disappears into history. And then Ted, instead, we we talk about the really the cause, the, the, the maybe uh, uh, different causes of psychosis, all with different uh, therapies. Some of them will be a uh, pharmacological, some of them will be psychological, some of them will be will be social, or some or different combinations of these. I think it's a very a, exciting time for, a, for, for people like myself who are interested in understanding psychosis. We're making very dramatic advances in, 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 the, in the understanding. We're beginning to see some of the, 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 the developments coming through. For, for example, when, when I was a medical student and went to be involved in the care of people with psychosis in an asylum, there weren't psych there weren't psychologists to express it. It's not that that uh, psychological theories were being ignored. There just weren't any decent psychological theories about about uh, psychosis. And one of the great things has been that uh, more psychologists, uh, more <coughs> people of a social social orientation, more pharmacists, the number of professions now involved and a number of able young people and caring young people getting involved in looking after people with with psychosis i think is is greatly increasing so i think i think this this augurs very well for the future well thank you robin for being at the forefront of helping us understand and also challenging the stereotypical media portrayal of psychosis you remind us that we all have some of those thoughts and those feelings and we're all on a continuum aren't we we all have the capacity to 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 go psychotic so that's certainly true Robin, thank you. I just wondered if there was anything else that you'd like to share or to talk about. I suppose the one thing I would like to cover is to say that the one thing that distresses me is different mental health professionals slagging each other off. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if uh, we're ever to, if we're to, to get the politicians to take it seriously and fund the mental health services appropriately, then we need uh, to to be quite broad-minded, and I, th I think that, I think there is there's been a there's there's been a lot of movement in this. Again, when I look back to the 1970s, in, a, in at my hospital, we used to have tremendous disputes between biological psychiatrists who thought that the electroconvulsive therapy would be appropriate for a patient, and and for the same patient. Uh, there would be psychoanalysts saying that what they needed was three years of of psychoanalysis. Now that's mostly gone, mm. and uh, psychiatry is much more uh, eclectic. That uh, the average psychiatrist will realise that there there may be a biological component. Uh, there's certainly a psychological component, and very often the the causes of the the, the illness lie in, lie in the social environment. But there still are some dinosaurs. Who say that it uh, that all of psychiatry is say uh, all of all of psychiatric illness is is biological, and equally those who totally dispute the fact that there is any anything in terms of family or genetic vulnerability, and say that everything is due is due to uh, to social adversity. I think we have to uh, accept that different. Uh, 
we, there, there's room in uh, uh, amongst those of us who are trying to help those with psychological problems for those who take a more socially oriented point of view or more psychologically oriented point of view a more biologically oriented point of view but they should each at least give sufficient res- respect to each other to realize that they're 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 all doing it with the best of intentions robin i'm so grateful for your time it was such an interesting discussion thank you don't a don't thank me i should thank you because i think it is very important that a uh, As I understood it, MAD in America was set up to be an interface between the professionals and and the user or patient groups. And in many ways, there isn't so much from the orthodox professional. So I think it's it's nice to have the chance for somebody more orthodox like me to uh, uh, to perhaps communicate with. uh, with people on on the website. Well, it's essential, Robin, that we present the broadest possible range of knowledge, experiences, opinions, and understanding that may perhaps be difficult to get from mainstream psychiatry. So we're incredibly grateful to you for being part of the podcast. Yeah, I think well, the thing, of course, is that people have been often subjected to very bad psychiatry, particularly in North America. Well, Robin, I'm very grateful to have the chance to talk about these things with you. So thank you. Yep, it's good. Okay, nice to talk to you, James. Well, I just want to thank Professor Murray for taking the time to talk with me for the podcast. And if you're interested in the papers mentioned in the interview or to know more about Professor Murray's work, you can find links on the post that accompanies this interview on MadinAmerica.com. Madden America News and Updates. So this week, I'm delighted to welcome Madden America founder Robert Whitaker to give us some updates. Well, thank you, James, for having this opportunity to just take a few minutes to review some of the things that MIA has done this past year and and where we're uh, looking forward to in the next year. And first I have to say, I want to say thank you to all our listeners and all to the people who come to our website, because we rely on our listeners in in two really important ways. One, uh, frankly, our listeners and our readers provide us with the funds to to do what we do. And I think even more importantly, they provide us with sort of the emotional feedback that uh, motivates us to do what we do. So a big thank you to everyone who's listening to this podcast today. And in terms of new things that we've done this year and that we're proud of, I think MI Radio is at the top of that list. And we started this in, in July, thanks to you, James. We got off to a running start. And here we are seven months later, and I think we've already had uh, more than 35,000 people listen to our podcast, which I think is extraordinary. And I think what I'm so happy about MIA Radio is two things. One, if you look at some of our guests, it's expanded the roster of voices that are now coming through the MIA um, network, so to speak. We've had interviews with people who've never written for us before. Uh, It's been an international roster of, of people being interviewed. And I think in terms of our goal of becoming a organization that reaches a wider audience of people and bringing them new thinking, critical psychiatry thinking, MIA Radio is really serving a valuable role in it. It really expands our bandwidth, so to speak, literally and metaphorically. And James, honestly, this is uh, due to you. So thank you very much. Second thing that I think has been so notable this year, and it fits into this same topic of expanding our our reach, our bandwidth. If you look at our affiliate organizations now, we have a one. It's headquartered in in Spain. The editors are in Spain, and that's a Mad in America for Spanish speaking people. We have a Mad in Brazil. That's been up and running now almost a year. We have a Mad in Finland that got started uh, this summer. We have a MAD in the UK in development, and we have a MAD in Asia in development as well. Now, all of these affiliates are self-directed. They really share with us a sense of the current disease model has been a disaster for us, disaster for society, and that we need to rethink psychiatric care. We need to rethink what it means to have distress, and people share that beginning point. But then every affiliate is allowed to develop their own editorial content specific both to the, their audiences, but also uh, what the editors themselves think is are the most important issues. And what is so great about the affiliate program is we can learn from each other. We can uh, experience what other cultures are experiencing as they adopt these, uh, you know, as they've experienced this disease model and what they're thinking for solutions. 
And I think, again, this speaks to the sense that our current disease model, which was exported from the United States 20-some years ago, has been a disaster wherever it has been exported to. And now you find societies around the world trying to rethink that model of care, develop a new, more humanistic model of care. And I think we can all draw a lot of um, emotional sustenance from being part of this larger uh, effort. So that's happening, and I think uh, by in 2018, we'll have all these affiliates up and running. And what we're going to try to do at Mad in America is start highlighting some of this news that is coming from the affiliates as well. Next, uh, Mad in America Continuing Education, which is – we started this as much as anything to have a online continuing education program that would help – promote these critical psychiatry ideas, the science behind it, to professionals, providers, psych psychiatrists, psychologists, because so often they exist in a world, a continuing educational world and a, a world of training that doesn't have any exposure to critical psychiatry, science, and thinking. So we started that. Uh, the number of people taking our classes has um, increased dramatically in 2016. We've had, I believe, well more than 1,500 students through our continuing education programs. And our latest effort in 2017 was a seven-seminar continuing education program on drug withdrawal. And it's been interesting, James, that has been our most uh, popular course that we've had yet. And it brings together a variety of voices, a variety of expertise, people with lived experience, psychiatrists, psychologists. And our idea with this first seven seminar course is we're opening up a discuss discussion on such an important subject. Frankly, it is a bit of a black hole in terms of uh, what is known about the withdrawal process, what are the most successful strategies, uh, what is the variations of experiences people have. And so it's the beginning of an effort that I think will become a primary focus of Mad America Continuing Education, and that is to try to bring together the experience of, of people who have undergone it and professionals who have some willingness to uh, incorporate drug withdrawal strategies into their practices and ha have them learn from each other and actually now make such support uh, more available, more a part of regular care. Now, our own webzine this year, Mad in America, we've, we're going to have more than 2 million visitors this year, which we're very proud about. They're going to download more than 5 million uh, pages. About 70% of that comes from the United States. 30% comes from outside the United States, which, again, I think I sh it shows how this whole effort to rethink psychiatry spans cultures. It spans languages. And it really is becoming a universal, uh, I think, focus and effort. So where do we go from here in 2018? One is just to continue doing what we're doing, which takes a lot of effort and energy. And I have to say, we run on a very small budget. And as I said, uh, it's our listeners, it's our readers who really support us. And we thank you for that. And we're going to need your continued support in the coming year. And the one item that we have besides strengthening what we already do, what I've gone over, is we want to launch a video project. And the video project will interview people whose voices so often are not heard in this discussion. Say the voices of foster care children or children who've been in foster care, they got psychiatrized while children, and then they become adults, they exit foster care. No one is hearing that voice of what it was like to be a child, a foster care child, medicated, just basically because you were born into a, a bad social situation and how it has affected their lives. So our, one of our goals this year is to launch a video project um, to reach people who've been profoundly affected by this disease model but we haven't heard from. So that's our big goal for 2018. And so again, James, I just want to personally thank you for, for taking charge of MI Radio, making it such a success and bringing a whole new group of uh, listeners and people into the MIA audience. And it's a real pleasure having these few minutes to, to talk to, your, to MIA listeners today. Well, I just want to thank Bob for coming on to give us that insight into Mad in America and some of the plans for next year. 
So thank you so much for listening. We'll be back with the podcast early in 2018. And from us all at Madden America, warmest wishes for this festive season and whatever you're doing over the holiday period, we wish you health and happiness. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.